independence from Britain in 1963, there was a revolution in early 1964, over 50 years ago. And that resulted in dire consequences for the Asians, but more importantly for the local Arab population, who suffered a lot. Shokat Molu, our speaker, a teenager at the time, and his family lived through that horrific period. That period is a sad chapter in the island's recent history. Zanzibar and Pemba, a sister island close by, are known as Spice Islands. islands. Apart from export of spices, tourism is the other major industry. Can I disturb you for a second, uh, Nasmul Pai? Go ahead. A lot of people are joining in and they're keeping their uh, audio on. So we request everybody to mute yourself. Please stay muted. I'm Yes, I'm finished. Nazmul, you can unmute yourself and continue, please. Let's move by, unmute yourself and please go ahead. Are we just having some technical difficulties with uh, no small by? Okay. Uh, can you hear right. me? Yes, we can hear yeah. now. Please go ahead and sorry about the inter. Sincere apologies for that. Um, okay, so apart from the spices, um, tourism is the other major industry in Zanzibar. And tourism is very, very popular with Euro Europeans. Won't spend too much time on, the, on Zanzibar because that is the subject for our speaker, Shokat Molu who is a retired chartered professional accountant. He lives in Richmond Hill with his wife. He left Africa in 1970 to study accountancy in the UK. Later on, he moved to Edmonton, Alberta, where he raised his three children. He was a senior executive in the Alberta Civil Service. After moving to Toronto, he served in the healthcare system in, Orlando, in, in Ontario. He has always contributed time to the community, serving as the treasurer of Edmonton Jamaat for eight years and as its president for two years. He volunteers at our Jamaat in Toronto and is currently the chair of the governance committee. He also serves other community organizations. Shokat, a dear friend of mine, has kindly agreed to relive the sad times, the tumultuous times in, during the revolution. And Shokat, we look forward to listening to you. All, over to you, Shokat. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yes, we can okay. hear you, Shokat. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, Nazmul, thanks for that lovely introduction. And uh, Nazmul, I want on personal note to thank you and uh, the Baraza management and all your helpers behind the scene for managing and, and controlling this, uh, this uh, conversation. Uh, 
I know that many people benefit from it, uh, and it it is uh, it attests to the fact that we have got so many people from overseas who also enjoy uh, participating in such forums. So please continue doing the good the good work. So. I'll start now with my slides, and I've got only about 20 slides, but I'll, I'll rush through the beginning because uh, it's a lot of history that uh, I will just quickly go through. But let me start first. Okay. Uh, Okay, so here is, here, I've got seven things that I want to cover, setting context, and this is short early history of Zanzibar, which most of you will find interesting. Uh, th then I'll talk about seeds of a revolution, the happenings of the day, and these are personal memoirs or personal memories, aftermath, the selection from said chapters, the sudden change to our lives in Zanzibar, and what happened to the key players of revolution and Zanzibar today. So without further ado, we'll just go through it. So here is a Zanzibari lamentation that's as true today as it has always been. You can take a Zanzibari out of Zanzibar, but you can never take Zanzibar out of a Zanzibari. And you, you probably can relate to this, uh, those who are from Zanzibar, that whenever Zanzibaris get together, they immediately break into the impeccable Swahili and they'd reminisce about the good old days uh, where everything was rosy and plentiful and people lived with each other in harmony. Uh, and, and also when they talk about it, they can visualize, uh, smell and taste the, the, the flavors of Zanzibar. A, a, along those narrow streets. But I leave, I leave that lamentation because I think, you know, 57 years later, after the revolution, we still talk about it and we talk about it with some sadness, but, but also uh, with some ha happiness that, that we lived during those times and we had a good life together. Here is a map of Zanzibar so that you can place where it is. So Zanzibar is uh, on the east coast of uh, Tanzania. And uh, when we talk about Zanzibar, it's, uh, it's, there are two islands actually, Pemba as well as uh, Zanzibar. And most of you probably visit Zanzibar, the main island. Now it is known as Oguya, uh, but not many people visit Pemba though it is beautiful in its own sense. And it's just, uh, you know, not far from, from Dar es Salaam. So if you're traveling by boat, it takes about one and a half to two hours. And if you fly, it's about 20 minutes. Now there is another island there, Mafia Island. It has nothing to do with Zanzibar, though it is a possession of Tanzania. And it has nothing to do with the Italian gangsters. So, so that is just uh, for your information. So short high level history of Zanzibar. Uh, first of all, I mean, the, in late 17th century, Portuguese visitors uh, went and occupied Mombasa and, and they also occupied the south to Mombasa and a bit of north. And I think those who have been to Mombasa, you will know that, you know, Fort Jesus, for example, was their garrison there. And then in Zanzibar, the old fort was their garrison. Uh, and the Arab traders who came from Oman, they were attracted to Zanzibar, very much so because of its fertile land and, uh, and, and the weather. Uh, and they took a liking to Zanzibar. And in 1690, they dislodged the Portuguese first taking control of Mombasa and later Zanzibar. Now at that time, Zanzibar was also a main slave market of Africans uh, who were being captured from inland uh, Africa and brought to Zanzibar for, for exporting. And in 1837, the Sultan of Oman, Said bin Sultan, 
he established Zanzibar as his main place of residence uh, while ruling the East Africa coast. And Said bin Sultan, when he died in 1856, there was a dispute among his children. And therefore, Omani Empire at that time was carved into Oman and Zanzibar. And one son took Zanzibar, the other son took uh, Oman. And that is how we find till today there is Omani influence or there were Omani sultans in Zanzibar. And so at least you know the history behind that. Then in 1856, British befriended uh, Zanzibar Sultan Majid at that time and colonized, if you like, uh, Zanzibar at that time. And then 20 years later in 1876, under Sultan Bargash, the slave trade was prohibited. But then German and British came together and they carved up the coastal Zanzibar properties in 1886 and they left Zanzibar uh, and a small coastal strip near Mombasa that became the sole possession of Zanzibar Sultan. The rest of it was carved up, given to, for example, uh, Tanganyika was given to the Germans and they held it for a long time. Uh, and then in 1890, uh, Zanzibar became a British protectorate with the Sultan was a ruler. And then as Nazmul mentioned earlier, December, 1963, Zanzibar gained independence from the British uh, as a multi-party representative democracy with Sultan as the head of, head of state with uh, Muhammad Shamte Hamadi became the first prime minister of the new state of Zanzibar. But then 32 days after independence from Britain, Zanzibaris learned a new word that we hadn't heard before, Mapindusi. And Mapinduzi in Swahili means to be overturned. And that is what happened by way of revolution. So that is just a brief history because I think it, 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 has, it has some bearing on what I'm going to talk uh, in the next slides. So what were the seeds of revolution? I mean, in 1950s, uh, there was a nationalist political awakening in, in Africa and uh, uh, Ghana gained its independence from British in 1957, and that prompted Prime Minister of Britain, uh, Harold Macmillan, to, to give a speech in South Africa in February 1960, where he talked about the winds of change growing across Africa. And true to his words, I mean, the, the winds of change blew across Africa and no, it didn't spare Zanzibar either because the people of Zanzibar, or the Zanzibar uh, people started looking for nationalistic uh, flavor as well in the way they, they were being ruled. But Zanzibar uh, was uh, divided in the, on racial lines. There was African majority and Arab minority as the ruling class and Asian traders mainly aligned with the Arabs. And I think Asians paid a tremendous price for that alignment that we'll talk about later. So there were three main political parties, the Afro Shirazi party, which was predominantly African, the Zanzibar Nationalist Party, which was predominantly Arabs, and a small party of Zanzibar and people's, our Pemba People's Party, which was a mixed race party that had split off from the two main parties. But two parliamentary elections were held in, in, in Zanzibar, uh, sponsored by the British. And it was, one was in 1961 and 1963. The 1961, you know, it, it, was, it was quite momentous because there were, there were riots there that we still remember the riots of 1961. Uh, but 1963 was reasonably uh, peaceful. Uh, and because of the way this, the seats were carved up, I mean, uh, the, it was representative, democr representative democracy, which meant that the party that won majority of the seats uh, was, was allowed to form the government. Uh, and that is what happened. The, the, Afri the Arabs and the mixed race party, they came together and they formed a majority and hence they qualified 
to be to be declared as the winners and become the government of Zanzibar. Of course, you know the the Africans were felt that they were disenfranchised, uh, though it was according to the constitution agreed at that time. But the Arabs were pleased to see the Arab Sultan as the constitutional head of state of independent state of Zanzibar. Now this. Uh, that because this feeling of disenfranchisement, uh, the, the, the Africans started to plan that after Zanzibar got independence and the British left, they will try to overthrow the government. And, uh, and today, I mean, when I look back uh, and the way the, the revolution was organized and carried out, I think you know it was on the grassroots Zanzibari Africans who mounted this, but but it was you know uh, foreign leaders like uh, Julius Nyerere of Tanganyika and some communist countries like Cuba, GDR, which is German Democratic Republic, and USSR. They were part and parcel in 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 planning and even to some extent executing that revolution. I mean, that is my personal opinion. I must say, I must put a caveat here. I'm not a historian, but I'm relating this from what I have uh, seen myself because I was only 14 at that time. And, and I was an ardent observer of what was happening in, pol in political scene. And, uh, and I enjoyed it to some extent. Uh, so I'm expressing some of my personal opinion, and I think with time and wisdom, I can now sort of reflect that perhaps, you know, it was not something that local Zanzibaris could have mounted on their own. So that is my opinion, and I know that there are academics uh, on, this, on this program, so, you know, I stand to be connect corrected, but that is my personal opinion. So what happened on Revolution Day? Now, Revolution took place on 12th of January, 1964. It was a Sunday. And as I said, you know, personal reflection as a teen, I'm a third generation Zanzibari. I was born in Zanzibar. My father was born in Zanzibar in 1926. And my gr grandfather was born in Zanzibar in 1896. Uh, my great grandfather uh, emigrated uh, as I came as a child uh, in 1864. So I'm a third generation Zanzibari, but my family has lived in Zanzibar. By the time the revolution took place over a hundred years or nearly a hundred, a hundred years. Uh, we lived in Ngambu area. And those of you who know Zanzibar recognize that Ngambu was uh, on the other side of the stone town, uh, it was connected with the stone town by way of the Rajani Bridge uh, that you know uh, crossed over the Funguni Creek, and and there was a long street uh, along that. Uh, after you crossed over, there was a long street that extended all the way from the Rajani all the way to Mlandege. Uh, you pass Changani and onwards, and uh, and there was uh, and there were these small, I mean, shops uh, where you know owners lived upstairs, and they had dukas, the small shops uh, below, and it was predominantly Asian, though there were a few Arab stores there, uh, and it was it was it was it was a hub, if you like, of trade. A lot of people traded there and a lot of people came and visited there whenever they were visiting Zanzibar. Now contrast that with, with uh, Stone Town Zanzibar, uh, it was predominantly commercial. Like, you know, you had, uh, you had uh, offices, you had some wholesalers and a few scatter, scattering of, uh, of stores, but all the, the major, I mean, the, the trading stores were in uh, in in Ngambu. so it was a, it was a popular area and and it was in close proximity to the African area and and you will see the significance of that when I talk about it later. So 
Uh, on 11th of, on the night of 11th of January, uh, the AFET was held eh, on the grounds of ASP headquarters, which was in the, in the, in the Ngambu area uh, on Saturday, January 11th. And ostensibly it was, it was a fete, but later on, it turned out that it was, it was a, a, a ploy to, to get all the Africans there to, to mount the revolution that had already been planned. And I mean, history says that there were about 500 Africans who got together and then they went, first they raided an armory at Ziwani Barracks, uh, which was, you know, not far from there. And they overpowered the guards there using all rifles and crude weapons. Now, it is surprising that, you know, there were no guards and, and they overpowered. So again, you know, it, it, it just goes to reason that there were some collusion with some of the African uh, sort of policemen there to, to support these armed revolutionary when they came in. Uh, and, and, and British had warned the Arab government that there, there was likely to be an, a disturbance after independence, but, uh, but the warning was ignored. I mean, this is what history tells us. And there is a famous quote that, you know, you, we still ponder over, which says that they mentioned at that time, Sirikali Sioki Kombe Chakahawa. In other words, a government is not a cup of kahawa, a coffee that it can be overturned. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and they were uh, pleased by the British, by the Arab government to the, to the British to, to take control, uh, to, to help, but, but it was obviously unheeded. And, uh, and, and then the armed groups uh, immediately sort of planned to capture other barracks and and Zanzibar radio station. By then, the, the British uh, it, it took, arranged for, or people arranged for the Sultan to leave Zanzibar with his family. And the Sultan did that in the early hours of Sunday morning uh, on the ship Sayyid Khalifa that sailed towards Mombasa. Now, you would have thought that Kenya government, which was in, Kenya was independent at that time, would let uh, the, the Sultan to, to go there. But you recall that, that Mombasa at one time was part of the Sultan's, Sultan's possession. And perhaps to let him in would have incited the local Arabs there. So they refused. And, uh, and as a result, the Sultan was in the, in the high seas waiting for some uh, port that will, that will accept him. Eventually, I think with the, with the British's help, uh, the Sultan was given access to Dar es Salaam and, uh, and, and the Sayyid Khalifa docked at Dar es Salaam port and the Sultan stayed there uh, for overnight. And then the next day he flew out uh, by an airline uh, to UK. The Sultan stayed in, uh, in uh, UK until he left you know, in 2020 and he, he, he was in Portsmouth and then he left and went to Zanzibar to, to, to Muscat where he currently lives. Uh, but at least you know, he was safe. But in the meantime, back in Zanzibar, uh, the, revolution, the revolutionary people uh, apprehended the government ministers and put them in custody. Now, uh, this is, while this is all happening, I mean, you know, we heard an afternoon of January 12, and I, and I recall distinctly this booming voice of a Don Zanzibari. Uh, he, he, he talked with, with broken Swahili, uh, and, and he was nothing but it designed to create fear in us as to who he was. So I'll share with you some of the some of the happenings of that day. This is, by the way, is the last Sultan uh, who was deposed on that revolutionary revolution day, and his name was uh, he was append, he was given a new title 
uh, at the time of independence, His Majesty Sar, Sar Sayyid Jamshid bin Abdullah. Now just focus on that picture for a moment because it tells you a lot about him. Uh, you can tell from the, from the turban and the style of the turban, the cone shaped, that he was Omani. And he's sitting on this throne uh, and, and uh, so he, a picture was taken officially as his portrait at the time of the independence. So what happened on January 12th? And, uh, and as a 14 year old myself, I mean, you know, I recall this, this voice uh, booming on Zanzibar radio. Uh, I said, this is Field Marshal John Okello. And he was, he claimed to be Zanzibari revolution, but his voice sounded non-Zanzibari. And later on, we found out that he was a Ugandan from Lango district. Uh, and his threats, and he threatened that, you know, anybody who opposed the revolution will summarily be executed. And he particularly directed his venom to Asians and, uh, and Arabs. Uh, to the point that he asked the Arabs in Malindi area, where most of the Arabs lived, uh, to come down into the street and prostrate themselves as he planned to wander through the narrow streets. Whether that happened is, I don't know, but, but that was his, uh, his uh, threat at that time. Uh, but at that time, the government had not totally collapsed because there was a police station called Malindi police station, which also had a small armory that the revolutionaries were trying to capture. And it wasn't easy for them. Uh, they continuously tried, but in the meantime, I mean, the writing was on the wall. Where we live, we could see Malindi police station and we could see the, the firing from both sides. Uh, and it was a scary scene because we always feared that those bullets could, could come and hit us. So we were told to not stand at the, at the, at the, at the window, but you know, go and stay in the, inside the house. So by noon though, uh, the 32 day old Arab government had collapsed within 10 hours. Uh, now then the looting starts. Uh, and because we were in the Ngambo area, which was close to the African quarters, uh, of course, the people just came to that area and, uh, and, and we could see the, the shops being broken into. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it, was, it was a fierce some time because our, sh our house was built upstairs, uh, upstairs and the shop was downstairs. And they were breaking the shops with a view to just stealing the, the, the goods. Uh, and so far they were not sort of raped coming upstairs, but it was a matter of time before they did. So we started to get worried as a, as a, as a family that, uh, you know, as, uh, as we had, uh, you know, family, family jewelry, uh, that we didn't have a safe deposit boxes uh, that we had or, or safe for that matter. And we decided to bury the family jewelry in the storage area behind the shop. And because you know everything is sort of concrete there, we just dug, me and my father and my grandfather, we dug the, a hole in the, in the concrete. We buried the, 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 the jewelry and then covered it with dust, dirt, and then put some furniture on top just to, to hide it. Uh, lo and behold, I mean, when we came back after the revolution, somebody spotted that, uh, that freshly dug earth and obviously, you know, all our jewelry was taken. Uh, the stone towns, that stone town, which was occupied by Arabs, Asians, Arabs and Asians at that time, was spared a large scale looting. But still there was fear across the, the whole stone town and in fact, you know, here I must say that, you know, some Asians were killed uh, and some women, women were raped. But mass killing of Arabs happened in the rural areas. And I think if you, if you look at uh, YouTube, there are a number of videos 
that were filled. I mean, one was called Adios uh, Africa. Uh, it is an uh, Italian crew that filmed people's Arabs uh, in the rural areas being marched to the being marched to the beach and then summarily executed on the beach and they and their bodies thrown into the into the sea i mean that is a sad chapter in uh, the episode of the revolution and especially when zanzibar was so peaceful and we all lived in harmony but but there it was now uh, on, on January 13, which is next day, so during all that looting and everything, we were in our homes uh, while the looting was taking place around us. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were on the next day on January 13th, the, the revolutionary came and announced that all the shopkeepers in Nambu had to come down of their, to their, out of their home and, and they have to line up. And we all lined up. And uh, at that time, it was myself, uh, my five siblings, my father, my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather. And we were all told that we were the prisoners of the, of the revolutionary. And we were being taken. We didn't know where we were going. Uh, we were told to board these open lorries. Uh, and, and you know, each lorry were packed with about 30 of us and the lorries drove away. So this is an interesting part here is that my father recognized one of the revolutionary guard. He was a driver and my father asked him, uh, where are we being taken? And he said, you are being taken to be killed at the beach. Now imagine, you know, I mean, how, how do you feel like, you know, this is, this is your death sentence. Is this your your last day? Uh, and I remember, you know, my me and my brothers, you know, we, we were shaking with fear, uh, and we had been told to keep our homes unlocked, which we did. Uh, but anyway, they took us, in fact, to Rahaleo, which Rahaleo, uh, for those who know who know Swahili, it's uh, Rahaleo means uh, relax today. <laughs> But, but it was hardly any relaxation. So we were kept there for over 30 hours uh, and no food, no drink. I mean, you know, drink, you know, there was one tap and there were about, you know, other, by then they had rounded up about other 1,000, 1,200 people. And we had to share one tap for, for water. And uh, some, somebody had, uh, some revolutionary guards thought of an idea of, uh, bringing looted food from one of the shops and boil it in, in, in saucepans uh, in, the, in the Rahaleo camp. So if you wanted food, you had to eat this boiled rice, uh, tasteless, unwashed, uh, but then you were hungry and especially children. So we, we ate that and we survived. Uh, and the next day, I mean, on that day, then the revolutionary government was announced by John Okello. Now, John Nikello was a, was a, was a bombastic fellow uh, and, uh, and uh, he sort of, you know, uh, played, played his cards right. And he appointed Abed Damani Karume as the revolutionary, as the president with the Revolutionary Council of 14 people. Now, behind the scene while we were being held, uh, there was uh, uh, negotiations going on to free us. And I remember distinctly three names that played a leading role in, in freeing us. One was an Ismaili by the name of Saleh Varsi. And I think if they are Ismaili friends on this call, they'll recognize his name. He was a tall man who always wore uh, uh, a face cap. Uh, Rustam Sidwa, who was uh, uh, a Parsi. And a Hindu, Dwakar Das Norarji, who was known in Zanzibar as Dakuban. So these people, because they had connection to Karume, they, they, they played a, a leading role in getting us to be freed. And after 36 hours, Karume personally led us, the, all the Asians, out of the camp to our waiting leaders. Now, I remember our waiting leader at that time was, uh, and, and people will recognize him, was Muki, Muki Pope Daramsi. 
uh, God bless his soul. Uh, he was very hospitable. He took care of us and he took us to Zanzibar to our mosque. We were taken care of until we knew what to do next. That what was happening then was the state of Zanzibar converted to People's Republic of Zanzibar, which is a, a euphemism for you know, a communist state. Uh, the red flag with the club insert was replaced by a new tricolor of green, black, and gold. Uh, threat of summary death opposing the government was announced, and it was being repeated every few minutes. And socialist regime friends like Cuba, USSR, and German Democratic Republic started guiding the new government. And, uh, and they were, I mean, the government, you know, had, had good control of the state. Uh, here is the picture of 59-year-old uh, Abed Avani Karume. That was his age when he took over Zanzibar. And his, his end was quite sad, so I'll share it later. Uh, now, what happened in the meantime? Uh, there was cultural shift. I mean, we, there was a lot of mistrust uh, between Africans, Asians, Arabs, and there were a lot of vendetta for past treatment. Now, there were, there were two episodes that, that I want to talk briefly. One is the killing at Tazia. We had a small mosque that opened on Thursdays uh, in Zanzibar uh, that on 19th of September, uh, a, a lone revolutionary guard, they all, by the way, they all carried guns. He walked into the Stasia and he summarily killed four adults and a child. And that was the end of them. And with no questions asked, uh, it was reported in the nationalist newspaper, the mouthpiece of Tanganyika at that time, that these people were planning uh, to start the revolution. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, the four adults and a child was killed and next day they were buried. And I recall uh, these four horses being, being taken to our cemetery. So that is one sad episode, uh, or sad chapter. The other one was uh, the abduction of Persian Sayyid girls. Uh, and, uh, and they were just abducted. And then I don't know what happened because the families did not say much and neither do many Zanzibaris know what happened because nothing came out for either fear or, or something happened that they were smuggled out, we don't know. But it created fear in the Asian community. And people thought of uh, smuggling their, their daughters uh, out of Zanzibar. And there were many uh, were smuggled out by boat, by fishermen boat to, to the east coast of, uh, to the coast of Dar es Salaam or to the coast of Tanganyika at that time. Uh, property, properties of Arabs and Asians for generations were summarily confiscated with no uh, compensation. Uh, Asian civil service were, servants were, were fired. Uh, there were restrictions on traveling with money. And that meant that anybody who had money could not take it with them. So there was an economic strangulation, but there was an innovative scheme by Hindu merchants at that time. And they called it Hajarna Lak, which was a way to convert 1,000 to 100,000 and they to smuggle the money. And the way they did this was to buy local clubs in Zanzibar at a thousand, and then take them to India uh, on ship Karanja and, send, and sell them there for 10,000 shillings, 100,000 shillings. And that's how they transferred money. But how much can you, can you take it out? And you can only do that during the club season and, uh, and, uh, and that, that sort of scheme also passed. Uh, we, Asian and Arab students, we had passed our grade 12 exam, but those results were rescinded and we were denied admission the second time. And it was in fact given to, to, Arab, to, uh, to African students. We were not travel, students were not allowed to travel outside Zanzibar. There was a new credo, which was to volunteer which was uh, you had to volunteer. Uh, and if you finish grade 12, 
you were supposed to go to the to the to the to the rural areas and teach others, but you couldn't leave the country. So a lot of people were were figuring it out how to 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 get out, and a lot of uh, our friends were smuggled out of uh, Zanzibar, uh, and and that's history. Trading licenses were not renewed to Asian traders, and uh, that's why. A lot of them, you know, had to leave Zanzibar. Uh, but in 1964, in April, we got some respite. We thought now things will improve because there was a union of Tanganyika and Zanzibar, uh, and the country was obviously named as Tanzania, that is, you see now. Now, what happened to the Asians and Arabs uh, who were who left who left Zanzibar? Some Arabs left for Dubai, Muscat, Kuwait, and the UK. Uh, many were given, many Arabs were given asylum in, uh, in, in these countries uh, and, in, and citizenship. In fact, if you go to Muscat I and mean, Oman now, you'll find there are a lot of Zanzibaris and, and they are thriving there. They've occupied uh, top spot positions in the government of, of Oman and some of them, many of them professionals and the same thing is if you go to Dubai, you can hear you know, Swahili being spoken. Uh, Hindus went to India and the UK. Ismailis were resettled by the Aga Khan first on mainland Tanzania and later in Canada. Now, Isanashiris, some moved to UK or Pakistan, remaining went to Dar es Salaam. And, you know, for example, us, we left and we went to, da to Dar es Salaam, our, our, I mean, penniless, but our, uh, the Africa Federation under the chairmanship of uh, Marhum Ibrahim Sharif arranged for us to get 5,000 shillings loan to restart life. And that's how my father uh, started, he restarted his life in a small town called Morogoro. Uh, and, and that's where we, we lived uh, uh, until, until fairly recently. Now, fate of the key players, and I'm running out of my time because I want to allow about 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, so, yes. Please continue. This is fascinating stuff. You know, people are really enjoying it. So just continue, don't worry about the time. We'll figure okay. it out. Okay, so what, what happened was uh, the Jamshid, the Sultan of Zanzibar, as I said, you know, he lived in exile in Portsmouth uh, in England for over 50 years. And now he's a 91 and lives in Muscat, Oman. And now he has got, you know, he left with young children. Now they're all grown up. And uh, if you look at uh, their family picture, I mean, you know, they, they, they still maintain their, their Zanzibari culture, the way they dress up, uh, even the Sultan himself, you know, he's modest in his, uh, in his dressing. Uh, and it brings a lot of memories when, when, when you see him. Uh, John Okello, the famous John Okello, who put fear of God in us, was expelled from Tanzania. Uh, and it was, it was engineered by, Julius Nyerere and Karume to entice him to go to Dar es Salaam ostensibly for a meeting. And then he was unceremoniously bundled and sent to his native Uganda. Now talking about John Okello, I mean, I think he was a fall guy uh, because you know it couldn't be him who planned the revolution. The revolution was essentially planned by others uh, and the key figure that we have heard his name mentioned many times and over is somebody called Abrahman Babu. So those who know or want to know about him, there is a lot of material on the internet about the exploits of Abrahman Babu and his connection to Cuba and the socialist bloc countries. Uh, Abed Karume, uh, the first president, was assassinated eight years after the revolution. Uh, by a group of Arab army officers in April 1972 at the age of 66. And, and he was killed while uh, playing Mao, which is the game uh, played by Africans uh, on, a, on an afternoon. 
and, and it was planned again that, that that's the way they'll take him out. The leaders of the deposed government, they were jailed for many years, many years. And, uh, and all of them have now passed away, including an Isnashri cabinet minister by the name of Abdursul, uh, Amir Ali Abdursul Alarekia, uh, a quiet man, but because of his association with the Arab government, I mean, he was also a prisoner for many years until he passed away. Uh, the, the last minister who passed away recently, and when he was in 1964, he was a young man by the name of Mauridim Shangama. He died, you know, about a month or two months ago. And, uh, and so that was the end of the chapter, an important chapter in the life of these uh, former ministers. But that was not the end of it. There was a lot of power play in the revolutionary government at that time, like it happens in any revolution. So many prominent revolutionary leaders who planned and executed the, the revolution, like Osman Sharif, Abdullah Qasim Hanga, Abdulaziz Twala, they were all summarily executed for treason. And we hardly heard anything at that time it was later that we found out that they had been executed. Now, what are the pers my personal reflection? I mean, we had to hurriedly abandon our home for over 100 years and some priceless heirloom and left for Dar es Salaam. Now, a lot of old pictures, you know, we, we, we took some of them. Some of them we could not take because, you know, you had so much time and, and, and uh, luggage to carry. Uh, so I brought, uh, my family brought a lot of pictures that, that I still preserve and, and admire them uh, with, with passion all the time. Uh, we had a lot of difficulties in settling in a new place, like you can imagine, you know. Uh, we, we, we tried to settle in Dar es Salaam, but it was too big for us. Uh, Dar es Salaam was difficult at that time. The, uh, you had to have Pagri, which was a key money to get accommodation. And then finally, we, we decided to settle in Morogoro, a small town. Uh, and, uh, and this was with the 5,000 shillings that, uh, that was loaned to us by Africa Federation that was duly repaid. We rebuilt new life from scratch, but we have no regrets. I mean, today uh, we are spread across uh, three different continents. Uh, our family thrives in every family that they have uh, uh, every country that they've lived in. And I think that is the story of most of the Zanzibari. There is, a, there is a funny story, I don't know how far it's true, that somebody visited this uh, Hindu uh, merchant in, in London, and he saw the picture of Karume in his living room. And he asked him, he said, Manu Bai, even you have hung his picture? It was only in, in Zanzibar people uh, uh, had his picture. And he smiled, Manubai smiled. He said, of course, he said, it's because of him that I'm enjoying this life to, today. So I think, you know, that is just a funny story. I don't know whether how far that is true, but somebody told me this. Uh, and it was an old person who told me this. So it must, there must have some, so there must be some truth in it, you know. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, today, where is Zanzibar today? It's quite peaceful, as Nazmud said. Uh, violence now occurs, but only fueled by inter-party rivalry, post the election time. Uh, and this is because now Tanzania parties are also in the, in the play for elections. So, so there is a lot of this Zanzibar versus Tanganyika kind of feeling. Uh, but it's still relatively safer than Dar es Salaam, Mombasa, Kampala, or Nairobi. Uh, tourism is thriving, impressive resorts. I mean, if those who have been there. Uh, Stone Town, unfortunately, is unkempt and gradually crumbling. And I'll show you a picture at the end. Uh, but there's plenty of food, including some exotic fruits and herbs not available anywhere in uh, in East Africa, and I'll mention some just to sort of uh, salivate your, your, your taste. Uh, shoki shoki, doriani, matufa, cinnamon, fresh cinnamon, cardamom, cloves, nutmeg, langi langi flowers, 
so I think you know there's plenty of uh, stuff that if you visit will bring back memories. Ecolo ecologically still unspoiled beaches and tremendous seafood if you go there. So those of you who have not yet visited Zanzibar, it is worth a visit if you are looking for warmth, Islamic culture, blend of old and new and friendly people. So don't give up on Zanzibar. It is still beautiful today, uh, less so uh, than in the old days, but, but more, more comfort, uh, comfort lifestyle is available there. This is uh, Beit al Ajaib, and those who have traveled by boat, uh, you will recall this, you know, this is, a, this is a site you see miles away from the coast. Uh, it, is, it was built in 1883 by Sultan Bardash, and uh, it, it, it was a majestic, imposing uh, 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 tower. Uh, and un but unfortunately, just uh, last Christmas, a uh, section of Beit al Ajaib, uh, it collapsed. And, uh, and, and it was a heartbreak. And those of you who want to know, to learn more about Betul Ajayib, there is a wonderful video in Kiswahili uh, that was an interview uh, with Professor Abdul Sharif that you might enjoy if you, if you can understand Swahili. But, but it, was, it was a moving uh, uh, interview. Now, what is happening to Betel I mean, Now, Omani government has committed to restore it to its former glory, and we are waiting with bated breath for that to happen. And that sort of uh, concludes my presentation. I've left my email here if anybody has anything to, to add to comment, I mean, they can send it by email if you haven't been able to, to comment on the, on the chat line. Over to you, Nazmul. That's fascinating. There is so much. I come from Tanzania, but again, I was just about your age. I vaguely remember the revolution and uh, yes, things were happening, but uh, the details, obviously, there is so much there you shared with us. Thank you so much. Uh, Hasnain, if I may, first question will go to Muhammad al Rabi from Oman, well past his bedtime. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Asante sana, Gwana, lakin vipi koloka kingereza lako kiswahili? Oh, uh, kingereza, please. <laughs> Hindi malumne ye, tora tora. <laughs> okay, uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon to everybody in North America. And uh, I don't know, good morning to everybody in this part of the world. Uh, my name is Muhammad al Rahbi. I'm a history researcher. I'm from uh, uh, Oman. Uh, first of all, to thank uh, Buana Narinda. He sent me this uh, valuable message about this meeting. And I said, uh, you know, uh, I cannot uh, miss this even though I'm, I'm sleeping. We had another, we had another, what I call it, Zoom meeting today. It was about Swahili language, poetry, and all that. It was very interesting because we had over 150 people from uh, uh, all around the world. Um, my name is Muhammad al -Rahbi. I'm a history researcher, um, history digital creator from uh, Oman. I was born in Muscat, and my parents were born in, uh, in, in Pemba as, as Zanzibar. And I travel between Oman and Zanzibar uh, uh, a lot. Uh, actually, even my fiance, inshallah, to be my wife is from uh, as, as Zanzibar. So, uh, so when I hear these stories, uh, I heard it thousands of times from uh, uh, my mother, my, my, my parents, and, and, uh, and I'm here in Muscat. Thank you very much, Abuana uh, Shaukat Molo. That was uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting. Um, uh, and I just have some comments and I'll just, I'll just make it quick since I'm a history researcher, if, if you don't mind, and some corrections, uh, which, which I think is correct if, if, if I'm allowed to do so. Will that be Very okay? Quick. Very quickly, please. No, I'll just make it quick. Okay. Um, just a correction, ZNP party, it wasn't the majority of, of Arab, actually. A big percentage of Zanzibar Nationalist Party was of, uh, was of uh, Sh Shirazi uh, a majority. Uh, the prime minister even was, wasn't an Arab. Lei uh, Shamati, uh, 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 was, uh, wasn't of Arab origin. Uh, his daughter, Bibi Zahra, lives in Muscat, uh, just to let you know. 
she works at the, one of the, of, of the hospitals. What happened in Zanzibar, when I saw the title, I said, I must, I really should attend today here. What happened in Zanzibar, it wasn't a revolution. And if we say revolution, by using the term, means the people of Zanzibar revolt against the democratic elected government of Zanzibar. And that is, wasn't the case at all, actually. Zanzibar was invaded by Tanganyika and uh, ASP, they just joined the, uh, the, the party later. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this based on, you know, sitting with, uh, with, with people with conspiracy theories. There are many books here written, recently books, like a book here, a very good book. And this is one of the best books with evidence called uh, uh, Kwaheri so, or Moloni um, Kwaheri Huru. Question, question Sorry? and answer. Can you please ask the question? You can make your own uh, program next time, maybe. Sorry? Ask question. Sorry. All, all he's saying is, you know, yeah, if you can make it brief and ask the question because we're already at four o'clock and, uh, you know, people have to leave. So, yeah. It's, it's one in the morning here, no man. So I'll just make it quick. Okay, uh, well, for me, I don't, I don't have, well, I, I mean, I have a light question later on. I would like this to continue and to discuss this with you in details, but, uh, but I have corrections. I don't have questions. So okay. Sure. Thank, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. And it's good to know that you're doing the research history. I would like to ask uh, Musadik, please, uh, you raise your hand. So yes, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. My, my, my name is Musadik Jafar Ladakh. I'm the son of Jafar Ladakh, uh, who was quite well known for his uh, contribution. Uh, he was also running Sultan Cinema and Empire Cinema. Mm -hmm. So those who are Zanzibarians would know my father. Mm -hmm. Now, he was very much involved also with the, um, uh, the government and personal friends of Sheikh Ali Mohsin and Abdelman Babu. Mm -hmm. Just one comment here. Uh, was that that Abdelman Babu, when he came back from overseas, from China, he came to our house at night and he tried to involve my father into being part of the overthrow of the government. So my father refused and he actually brought a couple of projectors. One was a Russian med projector as a present. And uh, my father refused and he reported this to Ali Mohsin but Ali Mohsin said, look, we are strong enough. We've got the British nearby, et cetera, and nothing happened. But in the end, the revolution took place because of the Manbabu was full of rage and full of revenge for him being imprisoned. And obviously the other point which came up was at uh, Tazia. My father was there that night mm -hmm. and there were three people and uh, my father was the one actually who was near the door. He took the gun away from the gun, gunman. And he was also the cousin of Kasu Nahosa, whose son was shot in Tazia. So I just wanted to bring up this couple of points. But thank you very much. You brought good memories. I'm a true Zanzibar in my heart. And Allah bless you for this program. Shukran. Well, Sadiq, where, where, whereabouts are you? I'm in Milton Keynes. Oh, yeah, Mr. Kiss. Okay, good. So it's uh, my, not quite your bedtime yet. No, 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 no. You see, the funny thing, my father was Jafar and yeah. my son is and my son is Sheikh Jafar Ladakh, who you, you probably have heard of. So I'm in, the, I'm in the middle there, sort of. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, GL Arakia. Please go ahead. I think he might be having issues with his uh, audio because I don't see his audio, so we can skip to okay. the next Hasten. person. Yeah, Hasten, you take over, please. Thank you. Okay, so here we, uh, I see only uh, comments. Uh, so I'm just gonna read uh, some comments very quickly while uh, you know people are get gearing up to ask a question. So we have a comment from Sean here saying, wonderful presentation. Shokat Pai, thanks for reviving all those memories. Looking forward to your book now. Oh, wonderful. I'm suggesting that you should write a book. Muhammad Moledina says, Shokat Pai, thank you so much for the most interesting, fascinating, and very scary history. So you have actually, Shokat Pai, scared some people. 
And he continues by saying of what you personally and your family went through Zanzibar revolution, very educational. Yeah. And then I have uh, Dr. Kimji here. It would have been nice to let the first scholar from Oman to give some important details. And inshallah, I think we should be doing a program with him. He had very good points, uh, Dr. Kimji. And uh, maybe in the future we will. And uh, I have another comment here, or if there's a question from Altaf Sadiqat. I was one of the guys who got caught on the change of results of entrance exam. We were dropped from King uh, George School to Aga Khan and then merged with Ben Secondary School, finished my Cambridge in 67 and immediately put to teach in Ishnashri Secondary School. And I ran away after six months to Dar es Salaam and so forth and so on. So now we can go to uh, uh, the Alus who have raised his hand. So please go ahead. The yeah, Alus. Just, just, just a minute. Uh, Shokat, are you okay to stay on? Yes, I'm fine. Wonderful. Okay, we'll continue. Thank you. So uh, alaikum. Which Alus though? There are too many <laughs> of us. <laughs> Okay. It, say, it says the Allah. So oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So yeah. Uh, Salam alaikum. Uh, Shokat, you, you did us proud. I thought I knew about Zanzibar and revolution, but uh, I learned a lot of new things. You, you did, as usual, uh, a fantastic job. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing. Oh, I, I was very, I'm younger to Shokat, so, so I, I don't remember exactly what my age was at the time. But uh, I recall that my, my sisters were coming from Dar es Salaam flying to the, to the airport and they were completely unaware of what was happening. And we were worried sick. I remember the, my parents were worried sick and they would recite and whatever. But as they came in, uh, nothing happened to them, thank God. And uh, thank God in our part of town, we were in the old town, uh, we were not taken out. But uh, fascinating again. Thank you very much for sharing all that information, Shokan. Thank you. Just, be, just before we go to the next question, just to let you know that uh, thank you all so much for participating. We'll continue. But just to let you know that we have these sessions every Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock Toronto time. If you want to be put on the mailing list, then you can email me. My email address is in the chat. Um, and also next week's uh, topic is eat well, uh, to live well. And uh, we have uh, a nutritionist coming. And this is obviously very, very important for our audience. Uh, we're mostly senior. Thank you. OK, over to you, uh, Hasmin. OK, so before I let the other person uh, go on the mic, who is going to be Abdul Bai Qasim, I have something to share with you. Talk about the word Tanzania. We would be very proud to know that uh, Mustafa Pirbamad, who lives in Orlando and who looks after this Koja heritage platform, was one of the contestants who suggested the name Tanzania. Uh, and, uh, you know, if he is here, he can vouch for it. But I think he was one of the 12th person who actually suggested that that country, when they joined together, should be named Tanzania. So let's go to Brother Abdul Bai Qasim, please. Yeah. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum, Shokat. <coughs> alaikum salam. Una jam ke kamataro. Shokat, are you the one who studied in Hindu Union with my brother Hamid or Norman? Yes, yes, I know both of them. I was in school with Hamid. Same okay, time. I thought so. I met you in Canada recently with Uncle Taki. Yes. Jazakallah, thank you for your speech. All right. I was, uh, I was in Zanzibar one day and I saw these two ladies coming from the mosque after Muharram Madles and I could hear them chatting and they were talking about the food, kichro. Kichro <laughs> makwa kaso. Lakini pani kidogo makwa jijo kwa hivyo kichro makwa pachi pachi. Fascinating. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have a question here from uh, Muntasir Tala and he's asking, uh, starting with salams, many people admire Baitul Ajayat 
what is your view of this building and how did it play a part in your younger days? Thank you. Shokat Bhai, please. Okay, so Betul Ajayib, I mean, you know, it was, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it was an iconic building. Like, you know, if we went to Forozani in the, af in the afternoon, mm -hmm. where we sort of, you know, uh, uh, stayed there in front of the ocean for hours, uh, and then we bought, you know, whatever snacks were available at that time, we always gazed at Betul Ajayib. And I remember distinctly the beauty of Betul Ajayib was that if a ship was arriving from anywhere on the, on the ocean, we will get a warning by way of a flag that would be raised on the tower of Betel Ajayib that people could know that there is a ship coming. So, and then there was a, a clock tower there and, and it always ran on time. Uh, it was a good indicator to us that it was time to get home because it was past our time out. Uh, and, and though, I mean, it was, it was kind of fenced in, we didn't go in, but, but it, was, it was an admirable building. And we took great pride that, uh, that it existed. So I think, you know, that is, that is the memory that I can recall. So there's another question from Raza Baikara. All revolutions are because of oppression and suppression. Was this true in the case of Zanzibaris? Well, I think, I think you know, I'm not a historian, as I say, but obviously there was a bit of that. Uh, to what extent? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was obvious to me as a, as a young child. Uh, but then, you know, you heard stories and it was mostly these stories were told at public meetings where African politicians were trying to whip up the emotions of the crowd to tell them how did the Arabs mistreat Arab, I mean, Africans, uh, even to the extent that some of them were cutting open pregnant women, African women, and, uh, and forcing out the baby. Now, I don't know how far that is true, but I mean, you know, it was, it was designed to to whip up emotions at that time. But I think, you know, if they are historians, I mean, they'll be able to sort of either confirm or reject that, that hypothesis. So we will go to those people who have raised their hands. So there is one person with iPhone. So if you want to, you know, uh, introduce yourself and ask your question, person with iPhone. Please go ahead, mute, unmute yourself and ask your question. You are seen here as iPhone. If you can't, then I will ask Ashok's iPad. Ashok, bye, brother Ashok, to. Yeah, I just ask. want to add on a couple of things, uh, what Shok and I say. First of all, on the day of the revolution, my father was at the meeting at the center of police by the name of Raymond was in charge of the he was called my father asked him what is happening he said to you hear anything I know not about the house coming to shock it by Asia we call it Bekelaba because we live next to the border no to us so she could remember and in fact, on the night, I remember when Sanctuary Toto came and shot a few people. And that, I remember that. Uh, the third thing is, I met a lot of people here in London many years ago. And he said, it wasn't a partnership with the very but it would change the street of looking around the island to the that's all I want to be. Okay. Thank you very much. So we will go to the next person, uh, Surendra. Surendra, go ahead, please. Okay, so Surendra Nayak from Dallas, Texas. Na uh, when I heard this, I was in Northern Tunisia, but it had just become Zambia. Uh, and uh, when I heard the news, we were very, very saddened. But I went to Zanzibar back in 1996, 25 years ago nearly. Very good memories. And as the first sentence was said, you can ask any Zanzibar about Zanzibar. Forget 
Okay, Zanzibar will never forget about Zanzibar. Recently, the Bethel Ajayab fell down. Felt very, very sorry sitting here. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful presentation by Shaukat. And uh, we knew more about uh, the revolution today than uh, all these years in the past. Thank you very much. Okay, our next person is uh, Badra. Badra, you want to unmute and please yeah. go ahead. I just wanted to say that I was in Zanzibar in September 2019, and uh, outside many uh, historic buildings, there were things written, um, informative uh, history was written. It was very sad to see that there was hardly any mention of the contribution of Asians made to the history of Zanzibar, to the economy of Zanzibar. Uh, as far as Zanzibar was, the present Zanzibar was concerned, Freddie Mercury was the only Asian who had contributed something. In fact, he had not contributed anything to Zanzibar. <laughs> his uh, life and his uh, fame was made outside Zanzibar, yet he was the only one who was mentioned. And one place where we read that the um, houses in the stone town, which were originally occupied by Asians, are now occupied by Africans. That was the only one mention of Asians that we read throughout the stone town. So that was very sad. Mm. Yeah, sad indeed. Go ahead, Asli. Okay, so here I have some uh, comments, uh, but before I do that, I have uh, iPhone still there. I don't know if his audio is going to work or not, but uh, he can ask a question while he's fixing his audio. I'm just gonna read some uh, comments here. Uh, Fatima says, we Zanzibarians can talk about Zanzibar the whole year, or the, I would say, in fact, the rest of your life. So <laughs> very good comment. Dilu says here, I'm Mustafa Pirmamad's cousin, and I remember Mustafa by having suggested the name of Tanzania, right? Jabir says, very interesting to learn the history of the revolution coming from a younger generation. Excellent presentation. Zahra Jafar Ali Somji, extremely informative and engaging session, mashallah. Having parents of Zanzibari origin, it was quite emotional and heartbreaking to hear all these horrific tragedies that occurred. May Allah give peace to all those souls who perished during that time. Amin. It also sheds light on the resilience of the Zanzibari people. Excellent. Alamin Qasim is asking, now this is a question, what is the name of the book you were about to show? And can you please share information about the Swahili study group? Shokat Bhai, do you have any information about the book that you are going to show? No, no, I think I think he was, uh, Alamin was referring to Muhammad uh, who, from Muscat. Uh, he, he talked about that he has, uh, he has seen many books or he's writing books or he's doing research into Zanzibar history. I have not written any books, so, so I don't have anything. And and in fairness to his comment, I, mean, I did I did sort of put a caveat that I'm not a historian, so it was my understanding of events at that time. And uh, and you know perhaps if he's given another forum, he'll be able to he will be able to clarify a lot of the things that he has he has uh, issues with. All right, so I'm going to go back to those people who have raised their hands. So the next person in line is Abdul Aziz Devji. If you can unmute and go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, uh, Shokar Bhai, Salaam you did an excellent job. You took me back to Africa, Zanzibar, mashallah, it was amazing. I remember the day you said those five people who were killed at the Mephil um, Abbas, Asia. One of the person, whose picture is still there in the mosque and says, well, the five people were killed. One of them was my Nana Baba, my mother's father, my grandfather. And he came at home, he told my mother, let me take Abdul Hamid and my elder brother Abdul Aziz to the mosque. And my mother said, Baba, they are tired, let them sleep today. So probably me and my brother Abdul Aziz could have gone also. And it was a sad night, it was a night of, uh, we were commemorating uh, 
uh, death anniversary of Shahada of uh, the Lady of Heaven, Bibi Sabina Salatu Bai Aleha. And uh, I remember very well what happened. And I'm glad you also mentioned my dad, my uncle, my dad's elder brother, Amir Ali Abdul Rasul Al Arkia, dad's elder brother, the cabinet minister. And unfortunately, he had no children. My elder brother was adopted by him, Bashir Dewji. And my uncle, I know he was very, very, very wealthy man. But unfortunately, he lost everything. The government took everything. And the closest place we could go to be safe was Karachi, Pakistan. And it was amazing. That country took us with two hands, no problem. They treated us well. And uh, no discrimination. It was amazing. Well, till today, Zanzibar is the place to be. Shokat, you did an excellent job. God bless you. Love you all. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Khuda Hafiz. So we also had, so this was actually Abdul Hamid and not Abdul Aziz. And we also had Abdul Aziz's uh, hand raised. So did Abdul Bai, like Abdul Aziz, want to say anything? I, uh, Abdul Hamid uh, shared exactly the sentiments, but I think there's a comment that was made from Oman that I, I definitely can relay and support. It could not have been the people from the island itself that would have created that revolution. It could not have people because for the people that we knew, like you, Shoka, all right, uh, when you look back, you know, I was born, bred, and raised on the little island of Zanzibar. And, uh, you know, when you look at the people that we were raised with, well, you know, they didn't have the jump on, you know, the strength to do what happened in Zanzibar. But the price, but Shokat brought back some real profound memories. I sent to sign them up. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. So, some uh, comments here. Uh, uh, somebody from iPad says it was very great to hear of my chacha, Amir Ali Abdurasul Al Arakia Devji, being mentioned. Shabir Mawani says that I was only seven when my family visited Zanzibar in 63 when. The uprising started. We were asked to leave on the next ship to the mainland. I would love to revisit Zanzibar and walk the streets of Stone Town and see the old donors. I'm going back to those people who have raised their hands. So the next person in line is Inayat Bhai Habib. So Inayat Bhai, if you can unmute and please go ahead, ask your question. Inayat Habib. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, lovely presentation. Shokat, if you remember, we were neighbors in Gambu. We were next to my grandfather, Kasper Yafib. And uh, thank you to see faces over here. Just to add a few points. Uh, some of the people who were put in jail uh, for the revolution was the speaker of the Z of the Hizbut, was Mohamed Ali Fazal, and also Ali Nathaniel, famous known as Ali Bomb. They were the instrumental of the, during the uh, party between the ZNP and the Hizbuz. Uh, I left Zanzibar 68 and uh, I see there, since then I went a few times. One of the, uh, the last was last year. It's beautiful, still beautiful. Lots of memories. My father used to work at the famous auto sales in Zanzibar. He used to be the Austin and Morris car dealers. Uh, I'm certainly glad that I see you were there. I don't know if you remember me, but we were classmates. We last left Zanzibar in 1968, and you went to Mombasa. I went to Dar es Salaam. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Next person on the list is Hassan's iPad. So Hassan, if you can unmute and please go ahead. And if Shokat Pai has any comments about the previous uh, comments, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, for uh, taking me to speak. Uh, I'm Shokat's cousin, and I can confirm a lot of the stuff that uh, he has spoken about. There are additional uh, pieces of information that I'd like to share with the group. Um, that there is a, the big question here is whether or not the revolution was the work of the or the mainlanders. I have a little bit more inside information because I was a member of a political party that was led by Abraham Babu at the time. 
And I can tell you unequivocally that even though many people say that Uma Party was instrumental in um, overthrowing the government of Zanzibar with the assistance of Cuba, uh, GDR, and other Eastern European countries, that is, in my uh, estimation, incorrect. Uh, Abraham Babu was not even in Zanzibar on the night of the revolution. He was in Dar es Salaam. I knew and, and still know many friends who belonged to Uma Party at the time and who ended up being um, very important members of the Tanzania government in the Tanzanian army following the revolution. And these people didn't have a clue of what is happening the night of the revolution. In fact, I attended the fete at the Afro Shirazi party on Saturday, the 11th of January. And it was at that place that I was told by Musa Maisara, who was one of the revolutionaries, that I should go home, that there would be problems at night. So, if you were to ask me who were the players behind this revolution, it was Nirere, it was people from the mainland who moved arms and people through to Zanzibar, and Abraman Babu and his party was not complicit, even though I agree with Jafar Ladakh's son that Abraham Babu did want to overthrow the government, but he did not in fact do that. I just wanted to clarify that from my point of view, uh, some people may have a different view, but the overall presentation of Shoka today, I'm, uh, I must admit it, uh, it revived a lot of memories and it was an excellent presentation. Uh, we have relived our lives again through Shokat's recollection. And I wish uh, Nazmul, if I can make a request that you have that fellow in Oman to participate in one of the future Baraza deliberations. Thank you very much. So Shokat Bai, do you have any comments before I continue? No, Hassan, thank you for that comment. And I think thanks, thanks for clarification. I mean, I knew most of the stuff you told me about your involvement, but uh, I wanted to protect uh, that information that was shared with me, but now you have spilled the beans as it were. So thank you. So Brother Muhammad Al-Rahbi, who is in Oman and is still awake, I guess, this is after maybe 2 a.m. his time, he is mentioning the some of the books that uh, has information and we should read. And he has mentioned the names of the books here. So I'm just going to read out quickly. Kwaheri Ukoloni, Kwaheri Uhuru, Kwaheri Uhuru, Zanzibar na Mapinduzi, yeah, Afrabia by Dr. Harith al Ghassani. So these are the names of the books. The next person online is Fakru Master Adam G. So if Fakru would like to go and unmute and you know go ahead and ask question. Fakru Master Adam G. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ashok Bhai, uh, that was a great presentation. I appreciate your time and efforts in putting it together. Uh, I have, uh, I had a, a question actually of uh, Mr. Rahmi. I think uh, you clarified it. However, I'm not quite clear about the name of the book. Um, Kwaheri Okoloni and Uhuru? Okay. Uh, and uh, Another question I have of uh, Mr. Surendra. Uh, you said your last name was uh, Nayak. Were you? Are you the son of uh, Master Nayak? Uh, we had a teacher. Yeah. Was, oh wow! <laughs> son oh, of he me. was our arithmetic teacher, mathematics teacher in King George. Okay, right. yes. Yes. <laughs> nice to see you. I, thank you. I finished my Cambridge in '52. Uh -huh. and 1953 went to Northern Rhodesia. Yes. Ah. In 1976 came to mm. USA. I see. 
Yeah. I'm the son of uh, Master Adamji, who was uh, a teacher. At I the did well, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good good well, to meet you all. Good, good to meet you. you. Okay, so here are, so, so here are the names of the yes. books, uh, Kwaheri Okoloni, Kwaheri Uhuru, uh, Zanzibar na Mapindusi ya Afrabia by Dr. Harith al Ghassani. And I have someone else who would like to ask a question. Somebody who... Uh, so, so we will go on for another couple of minutes or so, and then we'll sort Shokat has been very, very generous with his time. He put in a lot of effort preparing it. He did a masterful presentation. I think we have to be fair to him. I know we're having a super exchange of information, but uh, we have to be fair to him. So uh, another five minutes or so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have one and Narendra, if he wants to ask a question. Uh, it's, it's not only a question, but it's an observation, first of all. Shokat Molo, Asante Sana, thank you very much for the presentation. And my humble request to Ishna Shri Jamaat, I think this is a very healthy uh, meeting today, what we had on Zoom. And if you all can organize such as a cosmopolitan, what life we lived in Zanzibar. We did not have Ishnashi, we did not have a smiley, we did not have go and we did not have anything. It was a cosmopolitan society we live. And this will revive, revive a lot of tradition of Zanzibar, which we used to live in Zanzibar. Uh, I would say my best place in Zanzibar was Habib Hatia, where I used to go for my ice cream. But again, Having said that, there are so many other things, like Surendra, we had discussed. His father was one of the teacher, but I had Master Ibrahim Jaffer, Master Gulam Abbas, Master Bakker in Yun Smith Madrasa. So they were my teachers as well. I lived in Zanzibar until 1971, and I witnessed the revolution because I was also a press photographer. And I had witnessed so many things over there. In 71, I moved to Dar es Salaam, where I became a photographer with the daily news, or da we call it these days daily noise. <laughs> but I, and then I became a cameraman for internet, ITV, independent television news. Associated Press, and I have been observing these things very closely. I was, I was very much impressed with the memories which Shokat has, uh, Shokat has presented, but there are more, more people who have been unable to explain this way because probably they are not having the, the art of presenting the way Shokat has published, uh, put forward. I think there is a need within our each community to sit down and get from the elders who are still alive with us to get the cream of what they had observed 64 and backwards. Because like the business community, I remember there was a very uh, good tailor, Gopal Samji. There was a very good uh, 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 maker Topiwala. There was another good opposite Topiwala. There was a perfume seller, it's a Shinashi. He, one of his, his son's name was Amir. Datu, 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 Datu. Whoever remembers that one. Uh, there were so many others. My, my close friend, the late Laka, the lawyer, he had helped a lot of people in Zanzibar without any 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 fees, without any fees, let me tell you, without any fees. Luck had helped a lot of people. And I think we have we have to sit down and have some sort of a platform where we can talk about these things. I talked to Mohammed in uh, Muscat today and he was very much uh, happy that I put him through on this platform today. 
Well, if I can interject, uh, Brother Narendar, I know we have lots of sentiments and, uh, you know, a lot of things that we need to share. And I believe that uh, Nazbul Bai, there's quite a bit of evidence here that people would like to share their thoughts, their views, give us some updates, feedbacks, etc. cetera. Nazbul Bai, can you please organize a session then for people who would want to do just the same? So yeah, if you have just, a question, just, fine, please go ahead. Otherwise, one, there's one, one more person one more waiting. To add, to add just one short thing. There is a person by name of Ismail uh, who is writing a book on the contribution by the minorities, Zanzibari minorities. Right now, he is writing a book on that. And he is in Zanzibar right away. At this particular moment, he is in Zanzibar. And he is related to Muzamil family. So whoever within the Ishnashi community has any anything, like these teachers, uh, family members of the teachers, like Ibrahim Jaffa, uh, Malim Gulam Abbas, Master <coughs> Bakar, so forth. Bohora community. There is a Parsi community who has contributed on that book. There is a smiley person who has com uh, contributed. Uh, I have contributed. Uh, I'm son of a carpenter in Zanzibar, Popat Mulji, who used to be a furniture maker for the for the Sultan of Zanzibar and the British resident of Zanzibar as well. But unfortunately, I was not a carpenter by myself. But anyway, that was a very brief explanation about myself. But I have I have high regards of the Zanzibar Cosmopolitan Society and the way we live in that harmoniously. And and there there is I think there is a group in Muscat who's trying to organize such a thing. But COVID has come into into this world and everything is has been disrupted but the Zanzibaris in diaspora was supposed to be meeting in Muscat sometime next year but thank hopefully you. Thank hopefully you, COVID goes thank anyway you. Thank, thank you very much for the platform uh, I just have a little comment here by Hussein Paliwala he's saying interesting book on Zanzibar revolution by Amrit Wilson the threat of liberation and also Dr. Hussein Bai Kimji had raised uh, his hand. I don't know if he's still there. If not, uh, we have uh, one more person who has raised his hand. Fakro, if you want to make it very, very quick, please unmute. Just, just, just and then, one more. And, and then hold on. And then we will uh, give a last one minute to brother Muhammad before he goes to sleep. Okay, yes. so Fakro. Please yeah. continue. Uh, just one very, more comment. Make it very quick. I will make it very quick. Uh, I would like to observe that uh, I think Zanzibar was caught in, in the Cold War. Um, you know, we talk about East Germany and, and uh, Cuba, but I think there was also some game being played by the Americans, uh, you know, through that uh, program they had about satellite uh, station and all that. There was some something going on there that was a uh, counter to the uh, Russian side of the Cold War. That's all. Just uh, one observation may not be correct, but I have a feeling that that was going on there. So I'm going to give a last minute to Brother Muhammad Arati. Please go ahead. Brother Muhammad. Uh, it's uh, 137 here, so Fajr time after four, four hours. I'll just make it quick. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm building now uh, a media platform which will be focused on Indian Ocean, cosmopolitan uh, 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 East Africa, the Swahili coast, and all the people live there in, uh, in, in harmony together. And uh, I started with a podcast okay, uh, audio podcast. And since May, we have a Swahili news from Oman, daily Swahili news from Oman. And this was my initiative with a couple of young uh, lads, from uh, one from Mombasa, the other one in, in, in Zanzibar. And then when we started this, the podcast, I thought only people in Oman would listen to it. And I was surprised, this is, this is for all of us. And just to show you 
how uh, 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 not only Zanzibar, the whole East African coast, I'd call it the cosmopolitan East African coast, and I totally agree with Mr. Narenda here. When we started that, in the first week, a few people from mine in East Africa, now we have 80, we have people from 80 countries around the world. So, and, and we beat the BBC, uh, Swahili, Voice of America, and Dachavele. Why? Because the Swahili spoken, it is an old Zanzibari, classic Swahili in our, it's not a radio and people that think we have a, we have a massive radio in our mind. Soon, um, I'm preparing a presentation, inshallah, uh, maybe after a couple of weeks when it's ready, I'll show it to you. Thank you very much. We have a couple yeah. of podcasts. The second podcast would be was Swahili, Lugha Namil Lazao, and another, there is another show by the name of uh, Hadithi Zawaze. Okay. And I'm doing this contribution to do document to speak to Waze. I mean, I'm listening to stories now, and my hair on my hand just stood. And, uh, and we have uh, many people here where I, I, I wish for some time, I really interviewed them. So we started interviewing people here in Oman now, elders and these beautiful stories. And when I see people here asking each other, by the way, and this is, happens all the time, somebody would ask, uh, are you Ali's brother? Are you Fatma's cousin? Oh, I know how we went to school together. Sadly, many of these moment memories uh, I get lost. So inshallah, next time, uh, uh, when we meet again, I'll put there my, uh, my email and let's sit in touch and see if there, there is something we can, uh, we, can, uh, we can do. Once we brought youngsters from Toronto, by the way, um, we, we brought youngsters, young boys and girls from Toronto, from Washington in America, from the UK, from Greece, and these, and these young boys and girls, are the children of Zanzibari diaspora abroad. We brought them to Oman for uh, two months uh, as a summer school. And some of them, they went to East Africa and back to, uh, to, uh, to North America. The reply we had from, the, from their parents, they said, our children refused to come back. They just wanted to stay in Oman or in, in, in East Africa. So why we did this when the children went back and they say, now I know where I'm coming from. I'm the youngest one here. I was born in Muscat. I don't have many people my age or younger than me who are interested in East Africa. We have we have Waze like you who, uh, who are only interested uh, in that. And it's really sad. Many of these stories are getting uh, lost. Younger generation are disconnected. Some of them, they don't know even where they're from. So, so sorry, brother Mohammed, I have to cut you here, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I just want to share something with you that we have, uh, our Baraza Toronto website, and maybe through that uh, Baraza website, we can connect uh, you with us. And I have uh, someone else, Okera Pira, maybe that should be the last person to, you know, ask a question or comment before I pass it to Nazmul Bai and Shokat Bai. Just, just Brother. a minute, Asne, just a minute. Eh? Our email is barazatoronto at gmail.com. Baraza Toronto, that's one word, at gmail.com. Very simple. I would ask uh, Brother Muhammad uh, uh, Al Rabi to send his contact details there, plus the web, uh, webcast or the podcast details. Narendra Bhai, Narendra Gajar, anybody else, please send an email through to that uh, Baraza Toronto at gmail.com. I will put you on our mailing list. Um, and that way you'll be advised of our future programs and uh, hopefully you guys can help us too to provide speakers and share memories and all that. Thank you so much. Aslin, back to you. So can we take this last uh, person, Ukira Pira? Yes, yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Ukira from Orlando, of course from Zanzibar. I think this has been a very, very good presentation and I believe if we extend it and have some people prepared like me have a lot on revolution and the first day of revolution because I, I was from Nambu area and experienced everything about what took place there. Uh, so just wanted to say that if you extend this, we can continue with others too contributing their story. Thank you. Right. Yeah, we can see your uh, badge, uh, your badge or your medal that you're wearing is the shape of Zanzibar. So you're so much connected to Zanzibar. So 
Nazmul Bhai, back to you, and maybe we can uh, give uh, Shokat Bhai uh, last minute to, you know, put a closure. Right, we will. And I'll say just a question for you. Um, we have uh, chat, uh, the podcast information in our chat. We can extract it from there, right? Yes, and I think we will touch base with Brother Muhammad. On yeah, I'll send, I'll send you an email with all the details and we'll prepare a presentation yes. for each other. Yes, please. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, we will be waiting for uh, Shokat's final word. Shokat, go ahead before I do the closing. I don't even see him there. Shokat's not there? Oh dear, we overwhelmed him, eh? No? Oh, he's, he's here not. now. He's, he's there. Right. Yeah, this meeting went on for 45 minutes longer than uh, we expected, but we had a record turnout of over 200 people, which is uh, which uh, a testament to the subject, the speaker, and everybody else. And uh, thanks everyone for spreading the word. Uh, it certainly worked and did wonders. Shokat. Yeah, Nazmul, thanks very much for the opportunity. I certainly enjoyed it, and uh, and I'm glad that many people enjoyed it too. So I will, I, I, you know, and and uh, inshallah we'll have we'll have another such session in future. You did very well, and you, you could tell from the chat, uh, the questions, the comments. Uh, this was a an excellent presentation. A lot of information you shared. I mean, yes, quite clearly, you put in a lot of effort, uh, a lot of work into it. We first spoke about this uh, four or five weeks back or so, and you've been working on it ever since. We've been speaking to each other, uh, comparing notes and all that. But uh, the end result, I think an excellent uh, product. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us, participating in our discussions. Our email once again is uh, barrazatoronto at gmail.com. Uh, we have weekly programs uh, every Sunday, three o'clock, uh, normally for an hour, hour and 15 minutes or so, but Shoka did so well, subject was so interesting, went on for 45 minutes longer than expected. But anyway, that was great. Uh, so please uh, send in your email addresses and we'll put you on our mailing list and we'll let you know about future events. I have the whole slate of speakers lined up for the next two months. So lots of interesting stuff to come. Next week, it's uh, about nutrition. Eat well to live well. All right, take care, be safe. Thank you.